Issue 108. We start out with seeing Eggman telling Snively that on the widescreen before them is Knuckles, who is finally back to being red with just as little explanation as for when he turned green. Eggman explains that Knuckles had become powerful enough to alter the very face of reality, and his research is revealing that although things appear normal, a dramatic change has occurred thanks to him tampering with time and space. This one. With that, the original Robotnik runs through the green energy field that was in front of Eggman with no explanation about what it was first. And a dramatic change has occurred thanks to him tampering with time and space, and yet Robotnik showing up is not Knuckles' fault, so why did they leave me to believe it was? But yeah, Robotnik comes back. I really would have preferred if he had just stayed dead forever and we could have spent the rest of the comic happy that he got what he deserved. But no. Eggman somehow doesn't know who Robotnik is on site, despite having seen pictures of him, and even broadcasting an entire biography on him one time. And the Shadow Swapbots obey his commands because he's Eggman and these robots are his trademark. Although I didn't realize that at first because they didn't show me the face of the Robotnik they aren't obeying. And I'm not overtly familiar enough with the dark and edgy sad AM Eggman design to recognize them by the weird metal ears on sight. So good, this makes a lot more sense. Anyways, Tails and Nuthole asks the Freedom Fighters playfully to come out and talk to him as he's playing hide and seek. Unfortunately, they are rather than them all being kidnapped or something. It's nice to see these guys having fun together, having downtime, instead of always fighting robots all the time. It's really important to show the main characters, to show what their original, normal lives are like, to give more value to those normal lives, so that we can really understand what they have to lose when bad stuff starts happening to them, instead of always showing them in all the excitement and danger. Then from the bushes, Robotnik shows up, with white eyebrows instead of red for some reason. He says that this isn't his doing, and another version of himself brought him back in order to steal his memories. He then says that he's ten times nastier than he ever was. While I haven't seen proof that Eggman also fans music, nor have I seen him try to destroy every living being on the planet twice, so somehow I doubt that. And by saying that he was nasty, he just proved that he's lying about his memories being stolen, unless he means his memories was copied instead. Because, how could he know that he used to be nasty if he doesn't remember anything? Robotnik says he barely managed to escape his shadow bots. And man, he looks like he's literally made of wrinkles. He looks more like a mountain with a mustache. Sonic, fortunately still hating him instead of being all idealistic, says, Why should we care? You badniks are both from the same mold. Badniks are robots looking like animals, not Robotnik. That was a weird line. Oh, you idiot. You idiot. Instead of Sonic immediately getting Robotnik put in the knothole prison, the King and Queen Acorn prove that they've learned absolutely nothing from what Robotnik did to them all those years ago, and seem to actually consider helping him. Well, okay, the Queen's never met him, but she's still been told about what he did. I can't believe they seem to be actually feeling sorry for him. Well, I kind of am too, but the king suffered because of him. I'm just seeing a fictional character. And if all he's asking for is protection, then I'd say sending him to prison would be the perfect way to provide it. But they don't even suggest it. Sonic is the only sane man here, but the only thing he says that gets through to them is the idea that he might still be a robot, prompting Robotnik to be examined by Dr. Quack. And just because he confirms that he isn't a robot, suddenly Robotnik is allowed to eat at the dinner table next to Sonic, play golf with Sonic, and take a dip in the pool. Until finally, Sonic lets out a scream of anguish. This is so ridiculous it makes me wonder if it was all a dream. I mean, really? You think of anything, Robotnik not being a robot would put him in huge trouble because it confirms that he really is the same monster who was ruminating Mobius for years. At least if he was a robot, he could be reprogrammed. This is certainly entertaining, but also not very fun. Finally, Robotnik says that he misses Robotropolis, and now he's ready to face Eggman. Is anyone going to tell him about all the toxins in that city? No? Instead, they immediately cut to the Freedom Fighters casually taking Robotnik to the city, with Tails and Sonic playing Go Fish together. These are the kinds of interactions these two friends need to have to really solidify the friendship, you know, not just making dumb jokes. 
And I think that the sheer fact that Sally didn't get enraged with Robotnik could tell him off when he thought they could ever become allies really speaks volumes about how much her emotional suppression has kicked into overdrive, as she's working so damn hard not to let anything out that instead of calling him out on it or even showing resentment, she just said pants, whatever, with an expression of complete emotionlessness. And I tell you, that girl won't be able to hold it all in for that much longer. One of these days, she's just gonna blow up. Emotionally, I mean. Robotnik says that if he can gain access to his computer's hard drive, he'll be able to regain control. Why the hell isn't the king said, No, I want to regain control of Robotropolis. You don't have the right to do that. Everyone is so out of character with this issue. It's like, I know they're good people, but this is stretching easily forgiven to the absolute extreme. They really want to believe that even Robotnik could change. It's like they fully subscribe to the notion that amnesiacs are innocent. You don't lose your entire personality just because you were robbed of your memories. Wait, was he? Anyways, Sally says that Sonic, Tails, Antoine, and Bunny will handle the welcome party, while her rotor and Nicole will give Robotnik tech support. Wonderful. I'm not as mad at this as I was with issue 40, because at least here there's a shred of reasoning behind it, making it in character for them. They're supposed to be idealistic. But all of them? Even Sally? The girl who was even paranoid of Jeffrey? Is she so depressed at this point that she just doesn't care about anything anymore? That would make sense. Sonic smashes through some robots with his super speed, and Bunny attacks them too, with all three of the most competent freedom fighters together. Sonic wonders why Robotnik's computer doesn't look like a computer, and Robotnik nervously says, Uh, it must be you. Why the hell doesn't Sonic immediately act really suspicious? Or more importantly, why not Sally? She's supposed to be the most cautious, paranoid person of the group, although she's not entirely in her right mind right now. Robotnik suggests to Sally to take readings with Nicole while he'll access the mainframe. Robotnik presses a button, the rotor asks what's with the lights while the panel is so green. Finally, Sonic acts suspicious, and Eggman, right behind Robotnik who was working together with him the whole time, says that their molecules are disassembling thanks to his matter fluctuator. This looks like an idiot plot in a nutshell. All of this would have been avoided if they had just executed Robotnik, or at the very least put him in prison. But somehow Robotnik predicted that they wouldn't do either of those things, even though the latter qualifies as protection just as well, and it was all part of the plan. Immediately, Nicole dissolves all the tension by using her magic hacking bullshit powers to burn out the invention made by Eggman. By the way, why are Eggman and Robotnik willing to work together like old pals when they're both too much egotistical assholes to work together, and when Robotnik and Robo Robotnik were enemies? Just because Eggman sent Robotnik home one time? Then it's revealed that none of the Freedom Fighters ever believed Robotnik's story. And the real reason they came here was to destroy the device that brought Robotnik back. You mean the Molecule Disassembler was somehow the same device as the one that warped Robotnik back from back in time? How? There's a Disassembler, not a Reassembler. After it's lampshaded why they went through all the trouble of destroying the device, Dr. Quack explains that he kept from Robotnik after getting him a medical examination that although he had returned, his molecules were too unstable for the effect to last, meaning he ends up vanishing anyways. So they didn't even need to execute him. He vanished anyways, without even a whole story arc about him being there, which would have been interesting. And with Eggman's machine destroyed, there's no way for Robotnik to be brought back. No way? Uh, and why can't Eggman just build another device again? Does he magically forget how he builds an invention every time he gets destroyed? Doesn't he keep the blueprints? Can't he just get the materials to make it again? Really, the same question could be asked about every new device of his that gets trashed. Like, the time machine. Or the exact robot duplicate of people. But it especially goes for this one because he really wanted to have Robotnik working for him, so there should be nothing stopping him from doing this again. In the next story, Sally tells her parents that she's received a letter from an Overlander refugee, Robotnik's niece, Hope, while looking either emotionless about this interesting and heartwarming news, or inexplicably bored. Oh, do they have to write Hope's narration text in actual handwriting? I can barely read this! Hope was terrified when she first saw Sonic because she had never seen a Mobian before. Really, not in pictures, not in the news, nothing? There was a great war with them and everything! Was she that sheltered? 
Then we get a bunch of panels wasted with pointless recaps about stuff we already know. Hope had always believed that the Freedom Fighters were leading the Robians to freedom. She then reminds the audience that her main parental figures are still gone, and explains that she spent most of her life inside a spaceship in the last six months in Robotropolis. SIX MONTHS?! Eggman was having people in Robotropolis and not roboticizing them, and they weren't fleeing. For six months? Since when did that much time pass? Is that why the stupid back to school arc vanished so quickly? Anyways, Hope shows herself to be open minded for an overlander again by saying that not Hope was the most beautiful place she'd ever seen. I guess because she has no exposure to forests. And despite her being related to Robotnik, she was only treated with kindness there. Maybe it's just because she's a little girl. She then explains that a bunch of Overlanders had left Mobius with her when she was two years old, specifically. And more interestingly, it explains that the Overlanders remained in cold sleep while they traveled in those spaceships. The Overlanders returned home only because the power sources of their spaceships drained. So, if they remained in cold sleep during the entire time they traveled in those spaceships, how does she have any sort of memories at all of her time while she was growing like, I assume the cold sleep was preventing them from aging, but I don't know. The letter ends with Hope wishing that she could stay in Knothole, and the King and Queen grant her wish, with the story ending in Hope and Sally having a heartwarming hug. For the final story, Knuckles' mother is having an argument with her son about supporting Dark Legion of Idealism. I guess it's more that Knuckles has no social skills rather than being paranoid or gullible. He honestly has no idea who to trust. So he either goes with one extreme or the other. He says that it's not like the Mitters were completely innocent. You mean the people who guided the wandering tribe headed for Albion? How? What'd they do wrong? What do they have to do with this? Knuckles wonders why people won't hear what Dimitri has to say first, and Lara Lee reminds him that the Dark Legion are dangerous to her children. Wait, did Dark Legion brainwash him? Like with Propta? They couldn't have because they didn't have him around for that long, and they'd be bragging about it right now if they did. Then Knuckles' mother reveals that by children she didn't misspeak, because Knuckles is going to have a little sibling. Huh. Would he make a good big brother? I can easily imagine him as one, but he's so violent and angry sometimes. Knuckles is all awkward and flustered, going, Uh, are you sure? Which made me chuckle a little. I thought he'd immediately get all panicked and shocked and angry instead. Instead, he's awkward and stunned. More mature than I expected. Then at the High Council chambers nearby, Dimitri makes a speech, which starts out with him saying that his plan to restore the island to the ground was too radical. You know, I would have liked to see him admit, thanks to Knuckles showing him his plan failing through time travel changes, you know, maybe my Chaos Siphon would have screwed up. Maybe the island would have fallen too fast. I've learned from that mistake. Chaos Siphons aren't for me. But other technology doesn't have that problem. Saying that would have made him look a lot more sympathetic to listeners. Instead, he just says that what's more radical is the kind of society continuing to be split between those who welcome the new and those who cling to old ways. Thing is, literally every society ever is like that. You know, conservatives versus liberals, it's normal. And it's not a total disaster. Every society has old-fashioned people, especially in retirement homes. But obviously, the Kinnas are a much more extreme example, and it's more about purely technology, which is fascinating. And you can't say this isn't Sonic-like, because Sonic's had the nature versus technology debate theme since the very beginning, with Sonic being against the industrialist Eggman. Someone in the Echidna government asked what Mitra has to think. Wait, so Mitras aren't just guides for the Lost Tribe? There are also people in the government? So why didn't the first person who was made a guide for Lost Tribe already know what that word is and say, I'm not working for the government? It's confusing having one made-up word mean two different things. Mitra says that the Echidna people should be united, but they aren't capable of accepting so much change so quickly. And finally, someone points out how scary Dimitri looks. He's gotta be making himself look that way on purpose to be intimidating, because he could easily make himself look just like a normal echidna, but made of metal. Apparently, the echidnas worship someone named Aurora. Nice name. As Mitra says that Aurora herself didn't mean for echidnas to artificially replace what nature provided, and yet allowed them to do it anyways. Okay, so if cybernetics really is considered universally evil, then why don't they go yell at Spectre for having some? And they never exactly punished Faketober for having cyborg eyes. 
Dimitri makes a good argument that echidnas were provided with the ability to reason and think, so why not utilize those gifts for the greater good? Then we cut to Miss Frankenstein over here, thinking about how he has been in a building longer than she expected, and Jenny, after being worried because Knuckles hasn't found a solution to the problem, is shocked at seeing Knuckles talk to Leon Da when her mother refuses to talk about her. Meanwhile, Dimitri is questioned on whether he sincerely wants peace because the Dark Legion have several times tried to overthrow the government by force. Well, to be fair, he probably didn't think he had a choice and never would have imagined that they'd ever be willing to just talk to him. Why would he think reason would accomplish this goal? Knuckles then speaks for Dimitri, and at least admits that it's not easy for him to tell them to trust them, but the fighting won't stop until someone takes a chance. I still think the Dark Legionnaires would always hate the Technophobes, and why wouldn't they? Jenny's refused from going into an unauthorized room, and she proceeds to shock him, I guess, while showing that she's still a sympathetic girl by saying, I'm really sorry, but you'd never believe my ID anyways. And just then, Jenny sees a constable firing his gun, shouting that someone's betrayed them for the last time. And she says that she might be too late, and she can't just go back in time again and try again. Nobody realizes these things with time machines. The first story was by Benny Lee, a new writer. And at first I thought it was an out-and-out -out idiot plot where all the Freedom Fighters and even the King and Queen totally trust Robotnik after he was brought back from the dead just because they're that idealistic. We even see Sonic playing golf with him and eating dinner with him. But then it turns out that all of this was a clever lie. And the Freedom Fighters knew he was obviously still evil all along, pretended to forgive him and like him, and used him so that they could destroy the device that brought Robotnik back in the first place, which magically rewires Eggman's brain so that he'll never make it again, I guess. I didn't know they could be so conniving. I admit that there were a few surprises for me in this story. I wasn't expecting Robotnik and Eggman to actually be working together all along, instead of Robotnik simply scheming against Eggman. And I wasn't expecting Robotnik to vanish from unstable molecules just like that, instead of sticking around more. But this is definitely a better story on the second read, because you'll be really annoyed at everyone seeming to forgive Robotnik so easily in the first one. The second story was by Carl Bowlers, and although it was mostly just pointless recap, it ended up being pretty heartwarming at the end, as Hope reveals the full extent of how sympathetic she is, and is told that she's allowed to stay in not whole. That's good! And it even ended with Sally giving her a hug. She's agreed to a lot of hugs recently. I wonder why? The third story by Ken Benders has a perfectly reasonable debate about technology between the Dark Legion and the Echidnopolis government take a dark turn when it ends with the constable firing his weapon and potentially killing Knuckles just like his weird-looking daughter thought would happen. One, why can't she just travel back in time again to prevent this better? And two, why couldn't Knuckles have created a force field to protect himself with his omnipotence? Was he that surprised? Because it's been shown a lot that Knuckles can use his powers subconsciously, without even knowing he has them consciously. So there's no excuse. Also, Knuckles is going to have a little sibling, which is a nice concept to me, him being a big brother, and his being all awkward and flustered at the idea makes him more relatable. But none of that matters until the baby would actually show up.